So I want, I want to um, I want to say a couple of things before we move on to the next section about the language in uh, uh, eight. And particularly, I want to point out the. I mean, I've re the, this is the most important terms, but there's another word in chapter eight that occurs a lot that is often mistranslated in the in this. Okay, and that's the word hakarai. So hakarai is often translated in a very negative, pejorative way in this in this book. Okay, you know, hakarai ni suginai, things like this. You know, like as if the hakarai is something terrible, but hakarai is not bad. How can I simply mean something that you do? Okay. So the way it's used in in chapter eight here is again I'm going to read it in Japanese. Um, Okay, something like that. So, in other words, it's not a it's not something that I do. It's not my it's not the result of my hakarai. Okay. So that doesn't mean that hakarai is a bad thing. It means hakarai is what I hakarai is a term that refers to how I map out what my, my judgment and then my action based on that judgment. So the, the chapter eight is, and the translation is not too bad in this case. But Hakarai often gets a very bad meaning in the Rikoku translations. Um, so, since it is not performed out of one's own designs, I don't know what you guys thought that meant. I didn't understand that English. <laughs> anyway, um, so again, Hakarai is just a very common term in uh, Kamakura language. It's a very common word, and, and it's not a religious term by any means, okay? It just means something that I do, okay? So, um, in that sense, that, it, this, so this translation is fine for Hakarai. But um, in other places, you'll see Hakarai uh, translated as, in some kind of a negative way. As if, as if Hakarai itself is a problem. Okay, um, a number of people have talked to me during the break about Nembutsu, okay? So this, and I'd like to continue the discussion on Nembutsu, right? Because it actually turns out that Nembutsu, in fact, is problematic for a lot of people, not just for me and not just for my students. You know, I decided to do this book on Nembutsu, the book, because, in fact, when I'm teaching at the, I'm teaching at the university you know, for 20 years, and um, of course I teach Korean on Buddhism in some form. Now, at Berkeley, I have a whole class on Korean on Buddhism, and I'm able to, I think I'm a pretty good teacher. Uh, I'll be able to communicate everything except Nembutsu. When it comes to Nembutsu, the students always say, Sensei, what is it? There's nothing there. You know? Namo, Amida Butsu, Namo, there's like nothing there. But, you know, um, I take refuge in the Buddha, or it's the name of the Buddha, okay? So, um, so that's when I began to think about it. It was kind of a serious thing, and it's worth a uh, more serious investigation. But also, you know, there's another problem, and I'm going to talk a little bit about going back to history here, um, some of which may not be too pleasant to hear, but um, I think there's another problem, which is that Nembutsu began as a meditative discipline. Okay? The name of Nembutsu originally meant Anusmurti. Anusmurti is a kind of mindfulness. Okay? So you've all heard about mindfulness practice. That's really what Nembutsu was in the beginning. And that aspect of Nembutsu's mindfulness never ended, never disappeared. It's still there. It's always been there. But when Nimbus is got translated or reinterpreted by Honig as a spoken thing, okay, Honig doesn't even get this. This is going on along with what's going on in China. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't mean to take out the mindfulness aspect. So when Nimb when you can think of Nimbus as breathing in and breathing out, okay, you can think of that in two ways. Am I doing it unconsciously or consciously? I think for a Rendo, it's a conscious thing. Therefore, it's a kind of mindfulness. Being mindful of your breathing, like yoga. Okay. So Honan was said to do 60,000 Nembutsus a day. Now think, how do you do that? Can't do, in some texts, some biographers of Honan said he did 100,000 Nembutsus a day. So how do you do that? You can't do it if you're thinking of Nembutsus as kind of a formal ritual activity. But you can do it if you think of it as breathing, for example. Um, so again, you should always think of Nembutsu as a kind of mindfulness. Okay, and that doesn't, and that doesn't, as far as I'm concerned, that does not abrogate, that does not violate this understanding of what Nembutsu, perhaps in a non-subject object way, a non-dualistic way, still functions in the same form. But again, what's happening in Shinshu is, I have a feeling, 
Again, I'm not, I don't live in temples, I'm not a minister, but I have a feeling a lot of people don't know why they're saying nimbus. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Very true. <laughs> so, you know, sin to get shinshu because you don't have nimbus to, to practice as practice, right? You don't have like nimble to meditation anymore. Mm -hmm. So you sort of do it in kind of a ceremonial way, and people like often like do it by themselves, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And some people see it twice, some people say it five times, and it's not quite clear. And you kind of say it for your own personal reasons, and it's sort of not clear why you're doing it. Again, partially because of this. It's not instrumental. It's not a practice. So why are we doing it? And so there's a couple of things I want to mention about that that might be helpful. One, again, is what I just said. Nimbutsu is meditation. Nimbutsu begins as a meditation. The meditative aspect of Nimbutsu is never gone. You should never think of Nimbutsu not as meditation. If you do, I, I would consider that a mistake. It is a form of meditation. And don't think that because you're saying, using your voice, that it's not meditation. That's a mistake. Of course, there's voice meditation, absolutely. Okay. In fact, the whole reason why Nimbus has succeeded as a vocal practice is because it was successful in aiding concentration and helping people get into a meditative state. Yeah. Uh, this is last Wednesday morning. Uh, I uh, received a group of visitors from a private high school that uh, they were making, that they were part of. They were doing religious studies and they came to Enlightenment the Buddhist Temple. And one young man asked just a, this kind of question. Okay. Uh, well, what is this thing actually? Uh, <laughs> is it that, uh, yeah, what is it? And basically, my um, essay and answer was along those lines. He said, if it is a meditative practice, think of it as thinking on the Buddha, right. focusing on the Buddha. Right. So, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, I've, you look. People haven't done this, but I've done this. I look at the whole history of Nen, the word Nen of Nen Butsu. Mm -hmm. What's its history in China? How does it come to be used to express this phrase, Buddha and Smurti Samadhi? Okay. And then meaning it translates lots of different things from Sanskrit. There's at least six different translations, six different Sanskrit words that Nen translates. So that's part of what makes it complicated. But that's precisely what makes it rich. It's deep. So a lot of meanings happening at the same time. One of which is voice. So, again, I apologize to those of you who don't know Chinese, but this is not too difficult. Uh, okay, so that's the name of Nembutsu. So, so Chinese characters, lesson one, top means now, the bottom means mind, what's happening now in the mind, right? Again, obviously mindfulness, okay? The, the Sanskrit for that is smirti. Okay? Um, there's various forms of smirti. Buddha anusmirti is a kind of smirti practice. Smirti is a translation of mindfulness. If you go to, I found out from my students today that at the university they have a mindfulness training class students can take. Anyway, the Pali form of this is um, sati. So that you'll see mindfulness often, that people will use the Pali form because mindfulness training comes from the Pali tradition, from Theravada. Anyway, um, so have you ever seen this? Probably not. Most people, you've probably never seen this character, right? This is pronounced dian in Chinese, like nian. Similar, but not the same. So these two characters were confused in the beginning, in translation material. Why? Because Nen, even though it means mindfulness, had a vocal component to it, okay? And sometimes this got written down like this. So what does this do? This is a character for mouth. This is mindfulness that uses the mouth, okay? You're not sucking out a candy, you're speaking, right? This refers to voice, okay? So again, you know, uh, uh, Nembutsu, I think, from the very beginning, had a vocal component to it. This is not something added. Mm -hmm. But then as things evolve, you know, Shandao, Zendo, starts to then get, add this kind of level of interpretation where he says the vocal Nembutsu is actually 
the one that the Buddha wants you to focus on, precisely because it's most universal, because most people can do it. But that does not, that does not take away the mindfulness aspect of it. Now, another way to think about nimbles is in terms of ritual. And um, ritual is also kind of problematic in Shishu culture. Um, and I don't know enough about this to speak with any confidence, but Shinran obviously is said to be someone who doesn't like ritual. Um, and like in the Tani show, I never say the nimbles are from my dead parents, right? This kind of thing. So we don't do ritual. Uh, we don't, ritual is what? What is ritual? Well, that's a big question in the university. What is ritual? Nobody really knows what it is. But we do know this. It's very, very persuasive, powerful, and attractive. Every culture has ritual, and even animals have ritual. Animals have a lot of ritual. When the elephant dies, the elephants walk around the dead elephant in a circle. Nobody teaches them to do this, okay? This is natural ritual activity. I used to live in Berkeley as a graduate student, and I was on this third floor apartment. And below me was uh, the garage, the house next door. And every day, I mean, I, I'm a late night person, so I get up early, late in the morning, get up at 9 o'clock, and, you know, and see. So I make coffee, and I make some food, and I sit there, and I look out the window, and I would look out, and I notice after a couple months down below, I would see the, the roof of this garage. And what's on the roof of the garage? Birds, okay? Every, almost every day, not every day, but almost every day, the birds would gather there. And they would do a kind of dance. They would fly up in the air, and then come back down. And they did this over and over again. They fly up and kind of meet in the air and come back down. It's a kind of play, but it's also a kind of ritual. Why are the birds doing this? They're not getting any food from it, okay? They're not mating and producing babies. It's a kind of ritual activity that they engage in because they enjoy it, you know? Ritual is enjoyable action. Ritual is set, it's ritualized behavior, meaning that it's ceremonial, it's a set form, and it's symbolic action. It's a symbolic action, uh, and you know, dimension to ritual. Now, Shinju people often don't like ritual, but in fact, it's pervasive in all forms of culture. And I think it's certainly okay to include Nembutsu within the concept of ritual. We do the ritual because we feel a kind of familiarity with it, and it creates a kind of intimacy with the symbol. I come up and I bow for the Buddha. What is that? That's a kind of intimacy. I feel the closing, you know, this closure, this proximity, I'm getting closer to the Buddha, right? Again, as you said before, the Nembutsu can be a symbol of the Buddha, and the statue is a symbol of the Buddha. By doing ritual, we engage in some kind of interaction, right? with this symbolic object. And that's what ritual is about. Yes? Yeah, because uh, I think uh, in Jodo Shinshu, uh, we, I think we have to think that ritual in the three commas. Because uh, three commas are uh, action and the words and the soul makes our reality. Okay. And uh, our drawings make our reality hell. But uh, if the Namo Amidabutsu become our karma, three karmas, means that uh, word is uh, Namo Amidabutsu, and our thoughts is mindfulness in vacuum, and the action is ritual. You know, So the ritual is connected with a uh, verbal Namo and mindfulness in vacuum. So the menu is so genius. <laughs> <laughs> menu is so genius. So he interprets this passage of Tanisho into the everyday ritual. Right. And also he described about the meaning of that Barbara Nembutsu. Nembutsu was having all the time saying Nembutsu, like the breathing in, breathing out. And also the, he described the, uh, the mindfulness in gratitude in Nembutsu. Mm -hmm. So the Nembutsu is so genius to make clear the three other relationship between the three commas in Nembutsu. So in that meaning, the ritual has a strong meaning. Very good. Okay, so you know the Shoshinge is also a ritual. Yeah. You guys chant Shoshinge almost every day, sometimes more than once a day, right? <laughs> Why? At this point, if you you have it completely memorized, I assume. <laughs> What's that? What, what was that? So you don't forget. So you don't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the pledge of allegiance. Right? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so one of the things that really grinds my gears is... You mean that you mean that's a negative expression? I mean that in an incredibly negative expression. Okay. One of the things that really irritates me is when, is when I hear some of our people say, oh, we don't have a practice or we don't meditate, you know, and that's, and I, and I think it's because they're superimposing or what they view as meditation. They're, they're associating meditation or saying that meditation is what they do is zazen or like the... The GD people, huh? the self power people. Well, I mean, okay, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I'll, I won't go into that yet, but I mean, like, but, but they say that, you know, they associate this particular practice with, you know, you know, saying, with that word meditation, and that really upsets me. And so, but I'm wondering, you know, what, you know, like, is, is this, like, is this, is this because of, like, you know, outer, like, you know, again, like, because Zen has more of a presence? Like more of a presence in the United States, or like at least more of a like popularity, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, like you know. It's a good question. I mean, I, I just, I, um, I mean, do people say the same thing about ritual? We don't have ritual in Chinchu, or do people accept ritual? I don't think. You know, I haven't heard. I mean, like in my experience in the temples, which is not very long. You know, but I mean, like. I, Rituals I have heard them say we don't have ritual, okay. but I have been, I have heard them say that we don't have practice and that we don't meditate, and that that's what cranks my ears. Well, I think yeah. I, 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 so two things. It's one thing to say, you know. Well, all right. Let's first talk about meditation, then we'll get to practice over here. Um, what you're encountering is not that zazen is somehow or zen is more pervasive in America than Pure which it is. But that's not the cause of that problem. The cause of that problem is what people think meditation is. Because meditation has a tradition in Christianity also. In fact, you know, Christian mystics meditate. Okay, and what does meditation mean if you're if you're a Catholic mystic or you're a um, a Greek mystic? You know, in the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, it's a kind of communion with God. Okay, so it's a focus on the sacred. In the same way, the Nembutsu can be a focus on the sacred as well. If you think of Nembutsu as mindfulness, if you think of prayer as mindfulness, which it is, okay? So the word prayer also has a huge, wide range of meaning, right? Uh, people like to say, oh, Nembutsu is not prayer. Okay, Nembutsu is not prayer, maybe for 60% of the time. But don't negate it for the other 40%, because prayer is a big deal, okay? Prayer is much bigger than what we call petitionary prayer. You're not petitioning for something. Nemlux may not be that, but prayer is a big word. It includes lots of really beautiful religious activity, okay? Uh, that's very mystical. That's very much about mindfulness, okay? And therefore, Nemlux can certainly be prayer if you think of it like that. I don't see any problem with that at all. So I think that's another kind of, um, kind of simple distinction that people make that's messed up. You know, meditation is a very big word and includes lots of different things. Mm -hmm. And it's just that people's understanding of what meditation is is limited because they don't haven't studied it or they don't, you know, they only hear it in popular culture, right? Mm -hmm. It's like Nirvana. So when I write Nirvana, I try to write it with the diacritics. That is the bar with the A and the dot with the N. Second end. Why do I do that? Because Nirvana is also an English word. But Nirvana is an English word, is not what it means as a Buddhist word. Mm -hmm. Not it? So that's okay we can have nirvana as an English word, and people can use it in that sense however they like. But when I use it, I don't mean it as, some, as it works in American culture, or some band in Seattle that killed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that's really not what nirvana is to me. So I, in other words, that's my way to distinguish it. And meditation, unfortunately, uh, is, a, is a very common word in our discourse, and it's often used in a very limited way. That's just the way it is. People just don't know that. Now back to uh, practice. We don't have practice. But let me say this, okay? Nebuts may not be the means to an end, but if you don't have practice, I'm sorry, you don't have religion. To think you can have a religion without practice is simple, total self-delusion, okay? Um, there's no such thing. If you don't have practice, you don't have any reason to get up in the morning and do anything religious, any religious activity whatsoever. You have to think about practice in a much broader way, okay? And practice is at the heart of religious activity. Any religious activity can be considered practice, including chanting Shoshinke, right? So maybe somehow Shoshinke practice, I'm getting, yeah, I'm an outsider, I don't know. But my impression is when people chant the Shoshinke, it's very formalized, it's very deliberate, and they know exactly how to do it. But when it comes to Nembutsu, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much to do, how long to do it, what is the start, what is it in, how many times do we say it, you know? That to me 
things, right? Odd, okay? <coughs> so uh, what I suggest is that, uh, you know, if you want to do something new, you, in, you create them with the practice sessions. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to say, we're not doing them to the big attain enlightenment. We're doing them to as a ritual activity, just like we're chanting Shoshinge. Why do we do it? Everybody knows what's in the Shoshinge. Why do you have to say it again? Oh, you might forget. Okay. Then you <laughs> Okay, so once, if it's only in terms of remembering what's in it, once a year should be enough, right? <laughs> that's not why you chant Shoshinge. And that's not why you should chant Nembutsu. You should chant Nembutsu because you need practice. Because we all need to do practice because it's a discipline. It's all about mindfulness, you know? Nembutsu should be a form of mindfulness. And you can say, oh, well maybe I can't do Nembutsu until I attain mindfulness or until I attain Shinji. And I say, that's sorry, that's bullshit. You do Nembutsu in order to get mindfulness, you know? The very famous story of one man, uh, one of his interactions, with a, um, a Shingo monk, okay, who's a very famous kind of mystic, traveling around all the time, and he comes up one and he says, you know, uh, this Nimbus is saying, you know, I'm, I do lots of esoteric practice, I know all sorts of hand movements, and you know, I've done lots of meditations and things, and, but um, I'm kind of lost here, you know? <laughs> It hasn't really got me to where I hoped that it would be by now, right? I haven't achieved what I was hoping to achieve. And he says, but I can't, I can't believe in what you're saying about Nembutsu. I can't have faith that Nembutsu is going to do it because I don't have any relationship with Nembutsu. All right, I hear what you say. It's a very nice idea, but to be honest with you, I don't believe in it because it's new to me, right? Just like if you met somebody on the corner and you say, hey, chant the Nembutsu. Like, what are you talking about? So, um, so what Honen says to this monk is he says, you don't have to do it, you don't have to take my word for it. Just do it. Just do it and see what happens. Try it out. Maybe it doesn't work for you, fine. Maybe it does. And guess what happens? This guy becomes a big Nembutsu devotee. Okay, that will work. So that's not Nembutsu as an expression of Shinji. That's Nembutsu as a means to acquire mindfulness. And as you do it, in the process of doing it, suddenly its meaning starts to become more and more clear to you, right? That this is in fact an expression of the Buddha. So you can come to Nembutsu from lots of different angles. And you can do it for lots of different purposes. And maybe the purpose you're doing Nembutsu is not strictly speaking the proper, correct, orthodox approach. But as far as I'm concerned, if it's a practice that works for you, it doesn't matter if you're sitting with your legs crossed, you're chanting Nembutsu, or you're walking up and down across the room a hundred times a day, whatever it might be, practice is a good thing because it brings discipline. It brings mindfulness. And what better way to do that than Nembutsu? So I was, uh, last um, October, no, September, I was invited by the Jodo sect, the Jodo Shu, to give the keynote speech at their national meeting. You know, once a year, these big, all the Buddhist people in Japan have a taikai, a great gathering. And only ordained people like yourself are allowed to come. And I was the first foreigner that's been invited to do this. Uh, actually, it's the second time I did it. But, um, and I gave this talk. And then at the end of the talk, people asked me questions. And, and of course, the big question is, well, what can we do to kind of revive you know, our culture, because Buddhism is declining in Japan, right? So this is in Japan, this is not here. And um, and I said, look, who are you? I said, this is Jodo Shu. No. This is Nembutsu Shu. That's what it's called, okay? That was another nickname for Jodo Shu, was Nembutsu Shu. You guys are all about Nembutsu. And so what you need to do is engage in Nembutsu more vigorously, because that's what people will, will identify you with, and that's your strength. And you don't have to have an instrumental approach to Nembutsu either, you know? It's basically, again, the same perspective as Shinran. I said, but you have a Nembutsu Samadhi and mindfulness tradition that's very, that was very strong. I said, you should have Nembutsu retreats where people engage in Nembutsu practice for two or three hours a day. I don't know how many of you have ever done that. I've done that. It's powerful. It really is powerful. You go into a different mind space. It's just like a session in a Zen temple. I've done those too. So it has the same effect, you know? Nembutsu is a powerful ritual. And by the way, Zazen is a ritual too, okay? So by saying Zazen is meditation and Nembutsu is ritual, no, they're both ritual and they're both meditation. 
So there's just as much ritual in Dogen as there is in anybody else, okay? So Dogen also says, yeah, the, the, the Zazen doesn't produce anything, doesn't lead to anything. It's a ritual. He's engaging in what? A manifestation of truth, a manifestation of Buddha nature, just like Nembutsu is. So there's no harm in doing lots and lots of Nembutsu, and there's potential great benefit, which is deep concentration, experience of deep meditative trance, and very powerful mindfulness. And you get out of your head. All this Hakarai business, right? All this thing about making a decision about what I'm going to do and judgment and all the subject, object, you know, all that kind of stuff that we all talk about as a problematic <laughs> that Buddhism is trying to get us away from. That's what happens when you engage in the same practice over a long period of time. The practice becomes your identity. That's all you can do, right? And your mind starts to resist it. You don't like it because it's difficult. You've done a lot of minutes. If you ever done any long periods of zazen, that's what happens. Oh, my legs hurt. This hurts me. I don't like it. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I gotta go to the bathroom. Where's my girlfriend? Whatever it might be. All the things that come up in your mind. All of this is bullshit. It's all diversion because it's difficult, right? Man, this can do that for you as well. But you have to kind of devote yourself. Just the great thing about Zen is, and this is what unfortunately Jodoshu and Jodoshu should lack, although Jodoshu has it a little bit on the fringes, but not much. If you go into a Zen temple, they have a formal Zazen meeting, it's all set up. The guy rings the bell, right? Meditation starts. You can't move until it's over. You know what I'm saying? That's the nice thing about it. Okay, this is what we're doing. You're all here for that purpose. Stop all your other thinking, sit, get you know, your rings about once, you have a couple minutes to get your legs, you get your body in shape, and boom, you raise the belly, and there's no movement after that. So, you know, it seems to me that's the way the best of the the thing is that I did before. So, best of the means a special the Nimbus, you know, special time for Nimbus. Yeah. Can I? Well, he has a question. Oh, yeah. On Nimbus, do you look at the game where it seems like it came from, it had a focal component? Not in the beginning. Necessary. It's not necessary. Good question. In the beginning, the first usage of Nembutsu, there's no vocal component. The Hanju Sanmaikyo, which is the earliest text where you have Nembutsu practice, uh, there's no vocal aspect to it. It doesn't exclude that, but it doesn't mention it. Yes, I agree. Nembutsu does not require vocalization. And that's why I think that this distinction of having the voice or not having the voice is not significant. In other words, that's why it is meditation, that's why you don't do the voice. And if it works for you without the, that's why when you're doing, you know, this, this, like Nembutsu Seshin, if I can call it that, you know, this Pesaji Nembutsu, when you do that, sometimes you stop saying anything. <laughs> that's what happens, the voice stops coming out. Because you're, you're in such deep concentration, right? And then what's going on in your head, you don't even know if you're saying or you're not saying it. Yeah. It's perfectly fine. So yeah, that's a good question. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I think our Jodo Shu and Jodo Shinshu is quite different in the perspective of Shinji. You know. Uh, so and about the uh, for example, breathing in and breathing out and embutsu, it's just like a Zen meditation, you know. Just breathe in and breathe out, concentrate on that. Okay, okay. And but uh, Shira Shoni uh, talked about the Shinji, right. you know. So if we occur the by passion and suffering, and stress, uh, that, that is a place to hear the profound meaning of the embutsu. So uh, to think about the, the in that meaning, the hearing uh, is. Is that wrong? So, you know, not, not stop the thinking. We have to think about meaning of that. Then, mm -hmm. at the time, that, uh, the Shinji becomes much more profound through the lack of uh, hearing. It's the same at home. But, you know, the question uh, doesn't mention so much about Shinji. But the word is Anji. Yeah. But guess what? What word does Renyo use? <coughs> Anji. Anjin. Anjin gets a Josho. So Anjin and Shinji are the same thing. Yes. Okay, and Renyo uses Anjin and Shinran uses Shinji. Yeah. And I think Shinran uses Shinji because why? Because it's in the Nirvana Sutra. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. So the word Shinji has a very Nirvana Sutra resonance to it because it occurs a lot in the Nirvana Sutra and that's all about Buddha nature. But in terms of what Shinji 
is or represents. Anjit and Shinji are the same thing. Yeah. They're synonyms. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. It's true that Monpo, that's hearing the Dharma, yeah. is stronger in Shinshu culture than in Jodoshu. I agree. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, they're not that far apart. Just the emphasis is a little oh, stronger yeah. in this kind of thing. Yeah, okay, thank you. So maybe we should, uh, another uh, Nembutsu comment? If not, we'll go to the next one. Number nine. Number nine. Yes, thank you. Okay. I do. Well, okay. We'll go quickly. <laughs> actually, we could do nine and ten. Ten is only one line, you know. Ten is actually more interesting than nine, I think. But, um... The language of ten is very famous in Japanese. Mugi o gito surujo. That's quite well known. Um, okay, who would like to read number nine? I need a new reader from last time. I've got a different translation. We'll survive. Go ahead. Who's your translation from? Unno. Go ahead. Although I say the men do, I rarely experience joyful happiness. Nor do I have the desire to immediately go to the pure land. Okay. What should be done about this, I asked. Then he responded, I, Shinran, have been having the same question also. And now you, Yuen, have the same thought. Hmm. When I carefully consider that the matter of my birth in the pure land is sudden, without doubt, for the very reason that I do not rejoice about having that which I should be bursting with joy. <laughs> It is the working of blind fashion which suppresses the heart that would rejoice and prevent its fullest expression. All this is Buddha already knew and called us foolish beings filled with blind passion. Thus, when we realize that the compassionate vow of other power is for beings like ourselves, the vow becomes even more reliable and dependable. The working of blind passion also causes us not to want to go to the land and makes us feel uneasy, worrying about death when we become even slightly ill. Impossible, it seems, to leave this old house of agitation, where we have wandered aimlessly since the beginning of time. Nor can we long for the pure land of peace, which we have yet to know. This is due to blind passion so truly powerful and overwhelming. But no matter how reluctant we may be, when our life in this world comes to an end, Beyond our control, then for the first time we go to the land of fulfillment. Those who do not want to go immediately are of the special concern of true compassion. For this very reason, the vow of true compassion is completely dependable, and our birth in the pure land is absolutely certain. If our, health, if our hearts were filled with joyful happiness and we desired to go swiftly to the pure land, we might be misled to think that perhaps we are free of blind passion. Okay, great. Um, so, this is not too difficult compared to number eight. The only thing I um, want to comment on here is the term blind passion, which I think is a terrible translation. And I've been complaining about this for years, and to little effect, but anyway. <laughs> So why is blind passion a bad translation? What do I offer in its stead? This should be translated as defilements, not blind passion. It's not blind and it's not passion. Okay, both words are wrong. Bonno, right, is a translation of the Sanskrit klesha. Klesha means something has been tainted, has been polluted. That's really what it refers to. Blind passion, the reason, the reason blind, another reason why blind passion is bad is because it implies that somehow we have good passion and bad passion, you know? It's a weird idea, okay? So passion is, is just a strong emotional feeling about something. It's not good or bad, okay? Blind passion means what, our passion is directed in the wrong direction or something? That doesn't tell you at all what's really going on. Bono is a defiant. It means that your thinking has been messed up, okay? It's fundamentally in error. It's erroneous thinking is what we're talking about. Erroneous judgments, erroneous decisions based on erroneous information. It's like the computer phrase, garbage in, garbage out. It means that the information you take in because your sensory apparatus is not working properly, gives you bad information on the basis of the bad information you make a judgment that is inherently bad. That's really what a is all about. It's pretty simple. 
there's a lot of discussion of this in Abhidharma literature, and you know, I spent a lot of time reading Abhidharma literature, and I don't know, there's no mention of anything like blind passion on the Indian side of it. So I don't know who came up with that, but I really wish Nishi Hong Kaji would have dealt with it. Okay. So another possible translation is affliction. Okay? Some people use that. I use that for years too. What is affliction? It means you've been afflicted. Again, you've been kind of messed up. So an affliction means that a normal state of mind has been kind of rendered bad, sick in some sense. That's, that's, that's a, also a better translation. And the reason why defilement and affliction are better is because Bono is about the fact that for most people, most of the time, this operates on an unconscious level. Okay. So blind passion is not, un, I don't know how that can be understood as an unconscious thing. We unconsciously make bad judgments. We don't know why our, pre, our judgments uh, end up causing us to suffer. Right? This is all about the first noble truth of suffering. <clears throat> That's where the term comes from. So, um, now the point here, it seems to me that if you understand uh, Bono here as um, uh, defilement or affliction rather than blind passion, this is much easier to read for me anyway. That is, I don't take, I'm not overjoyed, you know, at this discussion of Nimbus and Tariki because I'm messed up. Why? Because I'm an Aquanine. Hello? I'm not enlightened. You know, I have problems. I think improperly. I make mistakes. Why? Because I have Bono. Okay, we all have Bono. What's the definition of a person who has Bono? Bon Bu, an ordinary person. An ordinary person is a person who still has uh, places in the Sanskrit, to use the Sanskrit words. This is a Sanskrit word. So, um, there's even a term in Sanskrit called Klishtamana, okay? Klishtamanas. Manas is, uh, refers, is usually translated as like this, okay? What's missing? Manas. I'll oh, start like this. That's a manas. Okay. So klishta manas, manas is a uh, this is an, again an Abhidharma term. This refers to a certain part of mental thinking that is defiled. In other words, it's not working properly. Okay. So again, in contrast to Calvin, where you were born in original sin, in Buddhism you're born in original purity, but the system gets corrupted. It gets messed up. It gets corrupted for lots of different reasons. It gets corrupted because of your own desire, because of your insecurity, because of your anxiety. All these things are expressions of bone. All these things are expressions of do. Right? Same thing. So uh, you have a klishna mas, you have a kind of disturbed mental faculty that twists things. Like if you're jealous, you know, jealousy I think is a really good example because you've all experienced it. Um, I love this woman, I love this person, I can't say woman, I love this person, and and then I see her talking to another, and I found out it's a woman. And you see her talking to another guy, and then I get jealous, you know, and then I think, what is she doing, you know, she has some other motives that she's not telling me about, and what are his motives, talking to this woman that I like, you know, that's jealousy, right, so what is that? That's bone, though, right, that's not blind passion, that's a kind of twisted way of interpreting the situation because it makes me feel insecure. So Bono is really about insecurity and anxiety, which is at the heart of the Buddhist notion of dukkha. This goes back to the Four Noble Truths. Right? So all Srinath is saying here is that, look, I'm not enlightened. I'm not a Buddha. I'm, a, I'm an average person with real problems. Okay? And even though I'm a deep believer in this form of Buddhism, I still find that I don't have the reactions that I think I should have. Okay? So it's, again, it's a statement of, deep statement of humility. It's very powerful, right? Uh, and of course, what Shimon is also saying is to the person asking the question, to the interlocutor, don't feel bad if you don't have, you don't feel right, you don't feel properly, you don't feel the orthodox proper thought every time you're supposed to. It happens to me too. So, you know, this also can be related to Dogen. Dogen talks about this as well. You have meditation, you attain satori, satori hiraita. Then what happens? Is your life perfect after that? Not at all. Your life continues to be messed up. Why? Because your bono doesn't go away because you have a satori. You have to have many satoris. You have to have many shinji. Shinji, if you think of shinji as an experience of awakening, this could be many shinji. Just like there could be many satori. 
you have a shitty day, and you're in an epiphany, and you feel great, and then the next day you're jealous, I'm your boyfriend or something, you know, same thing happens, right? You go back to the kind of bundles, okay? Uh, and so this is process of going forward and going backward happens all the time. That's what it means to be an average person, ordinary person, a bundle. I think that's really what Shinran is saying here. So, um, you know, I think that's really what this is about. I don't think there's a whole lot of uh, difficulty with this passage, but it's very moving, again, of course, to see Shinran's humility and his honesty. It's really touching. So, maybe we'll just look at 10 quickly and then we can stop. I think, thank you. So the last one, which was not scheduled for today, but it's only one line, uh, and it's a beautiful statement. Uh, so how, how about a volunteer for read number 10? Go ahead. Concerning the Nambutsu, no working is true working, for it is beyond description, explanation, and conceptual understanding. I have no idea what that means. So let somebody read this in Japanese. これ no? Okay. So I don't know what that means. 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 Concerning the Nembutsu, non, no working is true working? Why would it say that? How could Gi be translated as working? All right, anyway. What does Uno do? Does he have something different? It is pretty similar. The Master Shinran said in the Nembutsu, no self-working is true working. It's beyond description, explanation, and conception. <laughs> The so Dukoka says, in the Nambutsu, non discrimination is the essence because it is beyond phrase, explication, and conception. Yeah. Okay, so that translates the next line, yeah. That's, that's a little, yeah, that's better. Um, okay, I don't know how Gi comes out to be working, but in any case, um, so let's talk about that. What is that? Gi is working to hold you to do you mean? No? I do right now. Gi wa dou motteru? Furan wa ne. So in sutra language, when you see this word gi, it usually means significance. I can't spell meaning. I use a different word. <laughs> now there was meaningful, something like this. Or, um, it can even mean rational, you know, something like that. Or can mean significance. Significance, okay. Or, yeah. Mugi means it has no meaning, I think. So that says, it's the meaning of no meaning. This is a way of saying that this is kind of Irrational, improbable, inconceivable, something like that. That's what I think it means. And then the next line, Amy, what's the next line in Japanese? After what? After gitosu, fukasho, right? Okay, so fukasho means it can't be stated, it can't be said. Fukasetsu means it can't be explained, okay? And fukashigi means it can't be conceived. And what do we have here? Beyond description, explanation, or conceptual understanding. All right. Anyway, this statement is uh, essentially a statement about Nembutsu subject to show. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what Shinran is saying is that Nembutsu is, again, a kind of unique thing, right? Uh, and it's irrational, right? And yet there's a meaning to it. There's a meaning, but the meaning doesn't make any sense, okay? It's got irrational rationality. But this is very much like Nagarjuna. Mm -hmm. In other words, you could translate gi as logic, I think would be okay too. Not working. We'll use a different color. More dramatic. Okay. So you could say the logic of Nembutsu is illogical. Maybe that's the best way to translate it. But this doesn't work. This kind of there is a logic to it, but it's not logical in the usual sense. It has its own logic, something like that. That's why Nembutsu is special. It works in a way that's different than everything else. Right? So, uh, and 
I think that's fair to say. I think that's what she's going to do. So to translate it that way, uh, the logic of Nembutsu is illogical, okay? So what does that mean? Does that mean that Nembutsu has no logic? No. It means that Nembutsu is not logical in the usual sense, in the everyday sense, in the worldly sense, mm -hmm. in the rational sense, in the way we process information. You can say beyond dualism, but I'm not sure people understand what that means. <laughs> yeah, that's tricky, Nate. Right? So I think uh, that's a little bit different. I think the meaning is the same, but the language is a little bit different. I think this is probably better. The logic of Nembutsu is beyond logic, right? Or Mugi of Gitosu. Uh, that's, yeah, hi. So there's a spy from the online. <laughs> Kind of support the uh, ていうところがあるんですけども。ちょっと一緒じゃない。だからそこの so Hakara again, it's a tricky word. <laughs> yeah. So uh, but here there's no mention of Hakara, right? So I think that interpretation makes sense if you translate Hakara is working, but again Hakara to me you could say working for Hakara, but um Mugi of Itosu. Maybe the uh, Yeah. Well, okay. I apologize, I'm redoing this. <laughs> it's my prerogative, right? I'm the teacher. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it again. So I think it can, you can see uh, you know, how it's related, but I would do it this way. The mugi o gito so The illogic. Okay. I don't know if that's a word. Is that a word anyway? The illogic of Nimbusu? is its logic. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> <It doesn't help. laughs> yeah. Uh, this is just my own personal opinion. But this is Sashina. Uh, the thing that pops in my mind immediately is the letter in which he writes about being an opponent. That's what he was just talking about, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, and so how does that clarify it for you? What's in the letter, do you remember? Uh, okay. It's an exercise in trying to define something that's beyond definition. Yeah, exactly. So that's another way of thinking about it, right? So Mugi means it's illogical or it's ill-defined, yeah. Would you say that? I mean, probably going to sound more English, but what about the non-logic? Mm -hmm. Rather than illogical, non-logical. Oh, you want to say non-logical? Doesn't make it. Doesn't make a difference because the movie sounds more like. It's okay. I got no problem with that. <laughs> okay. The non-logic. Is that better for everybody? I'm not sure that it helps them. You may be right, but <laughs> I'm not sure it helps. Them. Okay. <laughs> so to me, this is a statement of a kind of the mysticism, the kind of mystical aspect of numbers, the transcendent aspect, you might say. In other words. The fact that this is not logical, that this doesn't function in a normal, rational, doctrinally appropriate manner, is in fact what the logic of Nimbus is all about. That it has its own kind of functionality. Yeah. So I'm just, I just wanted to share the footnote in this translation. That it says that they chose non-discrimination because non-discrimination is indeed the essence of the Nimbus of the Akar. Oh, excuse me, I should say it with the It deals with faith in the original vow without any discrimination or calculation. Non-discrimination is indeed the essence of the Nebutsu of the other power. Okay, non-discrimination. 
I think I think that that um, I think that's certainly a possible way to read it, but it, it is a bit misleading because so this is a good example of how the Tiny Show can be read in different ways. If you read it in terms of this other text of Shinran, then you can see it, read it in that way. If you just read it by itself, it has it can be taken in very different ways. So the way I'm reading it is just directly right. It's a statement about the kind of transcendent power of Nebu, so that it has its own logic that doesn't fit into normal doctrinal logic, right? So this is why the Tani Show is a fascinating and rich text, and why all these readings are possible. And it's certainly okay, I think, for everybody to read it in the way that they read it. You know, you can read it as Hakadai, you can read it as GDQ practice, and you can read it right, and you can read it like this. It's just another way to translate Mugi is to say it's nonsensical. It's not it doesn't make sense. You know? It's a sense that doesn't make sense. You know? The nonsense of this makes sense, right? Something like that. It's another kind of sense. It's another kind of sensibility. Something like that. I think that's another way. That's the kind of religious way of reading it. And this, you know, this sentence is powerful because it doesn't have any context. You know, when I read something like this, this is why I understand what Kajiyama Sensei was reading. How the hell could this be a whole chapter? No, no context at all, right? So, in my view, I think what we're seeing here is Yuyen or Yuimbo, the author of this, wants to separate this out. He likes this phrase, okay? Perhaps Shinran is talking about this here the same way he was talking about it in the, in the text on sacred scrolls. Uh, but Yuyen likes this Mugi Ogitosu so much that he wants to highlight it as a whole separate chapter, right? So I think for him, the phrase has big uh, meaning. Lots of resonance, right? Lots of implications that he wants to highlight. And that's why he puts it into a separate chapter. This is very much the product of the editor, right? The person who put the book together. I'm sure Shinran would not have suddenly said this for no reason, right? And we're supposed to understand it, right? So again, I think this also should make us feel humble about the fact that we're seeing this through someone else's eyes, right? This clearly is not Shinran's text as Shinran said it. This is an edited production by a particular follower of Shinran, who, and this is, he's presenting it to us the way he understood it, okay? There's nothing wrong with that, but we should, you know, should understand what that, what that is, right? Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, in uh, Buddhist writing of this general Sure. It's a very common thing to do throughout Buddhist history, actually. This is what exegetical writing is all about. You take a particular line out of a text and you highlight it and talk about it, and often it can lead to some completely different things, you know. So, um, and that's part of what makes Buddhism a living, creative tradition, that people respond in their own way. So when Renyo's talking about the Nimbus's breathing in and breathing out, that's not in the sutras. <laughs> that's not in Shinran. That's Renyo. So, you know, that's just, that's, things that, that's what everybody does all the time. Um, and I'll give you a, a much worse example than that. Worse because it's harder to understand and more challenging and more difficult. And I, I don't even want to think about it. It's so painful. The Nirvana Sutra is such a difficult text. 
because it's about the entire Buddhist tradition. So Nirvana Sutra frequently quotes the Buddha's other speeches, his other sutras, and then comments on it. Sometimes this is done by the Buddha saying, you know, when I said this, when I said Mugi o Gitosu, what actually I was saying is this, you don't know where he is from, you know, we've got to run around, find his quote somewhere in some other sutra. Sometimes it occurs in the form of a monk raises his hand and says, you know, 40, 14 years ago I was at Gris, you know, I was on Vulture Peak and you said this. This seems very different than what you're saying today. And we go, oh my God, how do we find that? We look around, look around, you know. The original Nirvana Sutra, the same name, Mahapayana, exactly the same title, which was a pre Mahayana text. Actually, the last sermon was done, you can read it in the Pali Canon. That entire sutra in Pali is in the Mahayana version. That entire sutra in Pali is about five pages in the textual canon. The Nirvana Sutra is 240 pages, okay? That's all cut up into little bits, and it pop, 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 appears here, there, and everywhere. Oof. It is such a headache to try to untangle this whole thing, but that happens all the time. So what's going on is this, the sutta, the religion is commenting on itself, okay? It's a very common process, and that's what we're doing today. You know, that's what hopefully all of you are doing, and I think it's a perfectly good thing. Yeah. When we do these types of translations, given the fact that language is not a static item, Right. How do we know you're translating today what he was saying back then, even though it's the same word? I don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All I can do is do the best I can. So, of course, you know, it's a good question. It's a question I ask myself. And um, all we can do is, um, as far as I'm concerned, it depends on, first of all, how seriously you take the test, right? You can say, oh, I don't like all these translations of Tiny Show, I'm going to do my own translation and I'll just do it. You know, I could, the translators, Tiny Show is not a very big work. I get translated one month, okay? And I could publish it because I publish lots of books. I have lots of good relationships with publishers. They put it out. But I don't want to do that. Precisely because the Tiny Show is so well read and so well studied and so influential. So if I'm going to do a trans, another translation, I want to do something that I think about very carefully. So. One thing I try to do is to get my mind into the head of people living at that time, as you mentioned, right? So for example, uh, chapter three is Akuni problem. What is a bad evil person? The other one translates it as evil person. Um, so I am quite convinced now, after looking at this for a long time, that the term Akuni comes from two different sources. It's not in the Pure Land Sutras. It's not discussed hardly at all in the Pure Doctrine. You have this five up thing at the end of the longer sutra, but that's not the way it's used here, okay? That actually tells you what these bad people are doing, you know? It's very much a moral injunction against doing bad things. It's a karmic statement. Um, I'm convinced that Akunin and the Tani Show comes from two sources. One, clearly Shinran's getting it from the Nirvana Sutra in some sense, because that term, that actual term occurs a lot. The second thing is that it occurs from the way people are using the word Aku in Kamakura period society, in Japanese society at that time. And one of the things you see in Japanese society at that time is the word Aku, uh, again, using any evil or bad, is used by samurai as a kind of boasting. It's sort of like, hey, look at me. You know, sort of like someone from the ghetto wearing gold chains around their neck, you know? Showing, showing off their muscles, because they go to the gym and they work out their muscles good, and they wear really tight t-shirts, you know, so you can see their muscles yeah. kind of thing. That's what Aku means at that time in military culture. In other words, samurai add the word, they add intentionally the word Aku to their names. It's a way of boasting how bad they were, how bad I am, meaning how tough, how strong I am. It's a way of expressing your bravado, your maleness, right? So uh, see that in the Heike Monogatari, for example, this occurs here and there. So Aku at that time, Shinran is hearing this term being used at that time in that context. So I want to take that into consideration too, okay? I think all those things are relevant. Now, in this case, because Aku is a very unusual word, and its meaning is powerful, so when it's, when it's used a lot, we can, and that's why Samurai were attracted to it, because it is a powerful word. I'm lucky, we're lucky because we have that evidence, right? We think about why Shinran is using that word. But there are lots of words in which we don't have evidence like that. 
The real problem in translating, um, so for translating Shinran, then we have to figure out what's happening again in 13th century Japanese society. So we're translating uh, the Nirvana Sutra, then we have another problem, which is, which I'm translating from Chinese, but the Chinese are translated from Sanskrit. Actually, not Sanskrit, some other Indic dialect of Sanskrit. Um, now, I have some Sanskrit fragments. We have about 40 fragments of the Nirvana Sutra. Um, now, that means 99% of the Chinese text doesn't have Sanskrit to look at. But in cases it does, that raises the question, well, should I be translating the Sanskrit or the Chinese? If the Chinese renders what's in Sanskrit, and I have the Sanskrit, shouldn't I be going back to the Sanskrit if I'm representing the sutra? Tricky question. Um, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so the, most of the time, the answer for me is no, because I'm translating the text as it was read in China and Japan and Korea and Vietnam. That means that I'm translating as a Chinese word. And the Chinese and the Koreans and the Japanese and Vietnamese did not know Sanskrit. The number of people in China or Japan or Korea who knew Sanskrit is, you can count on one hand, okay? It's very, very few. So in that sense, we should, I should render what the Chinese have. It's a Chinese work. It's a Chinese production in Chinese culture. And therefore, the language is what? Fifth century Chinese. So, like Chinman with Aku, should I go back and figure out what fifth century Chinese look like? I should. But that's a lot harder to do, you know? I do spend some time looking at 5th century or six, what's called 6th dynasty Chinese literature at that time, 5th, 6th century, but that's a big test. So this problem is always there. And if you're, if you're like me, you're kind of scholastically, academically oriented, then you feel obliged to use every resource you possibly can. So there's a lot of names, for example, in the Nirvana Sutra, in which the Chinese character is only used for the sound. There's no meaning in it. But that's an India, it's an Indi Indic name, it's an Indian name. So I have to reconstruct the name in Sanskrit or in India, in some Indian language. How do I do that? Well, some of these names are in the dictionary, so most of them are not. And the only way to do that is to figure out not how the character is pronounced today, because it's not pronounced the same way today, but how it was pronounced in the fifth century. How do we do that? Well, that's a linguist problem. There are scholars who work on this. And one of the ways they work on this is because they take, they use a lot of Buddhist literature. Not because they're interested in Buddhism, but because we have the Chinese characters used to express the name of something, and sometimes that can be traced to a Sanskrit form. So they know these characters have to approximate a sound that looks like this, you know what I'm saying? So we have a lot of books, you know, people study this kind of thing, trying to reproduce this pronunciation of this character at this period of Chinese history. So I use all that stuff. The books don't agree with each other. <laughs> you know? and, and there are cases where I have uh, the Chinese uh, characters, and I'm told that these characters represent this sound, and then I have a Sanskrit fragment, a little piece, a little fragment, and I look it up, and the spelling is different. <laughs> so that means in this case, either the Chinese is translating a different text in the fragment, right? Or it's not Sanskrit, it's something else, you know what I'm saying? So it's sort of an endless problem. If you think about this too much, then you give up and you don't do any work. <laughs> <laughs> you study Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> what you're talking about is kind of similar to what I understand that the devil's uh, intelligence analysis, traffic analysis. Okay. Try to figure out what the flow is. Because you can't read the messages because the, the, the flow tells you something. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, this stuff is very tricky. It's very complicated, and um, you know, I'm very, very grateful. I'm on the of that. <laughs> I got a job at this wonderful university that supports this kind of work, you know, and they they support me, and they know that it's in some sense impossible, but they know that it's valuable nonetheless. I will do my best, and then in 50 years or 100 years, someone will do it again, <laughs> and then they'll do a better job, and that's fine, you know. But the only translation that was done of, say, the Nirvana Sutra prior to now was horrible. And it was done by a Japanese scholar who couldn't read any of the names, you know, that I'm, that I'm talking about. People's names, names of plants, there's names of medicines. There's a lot of medicine, a lot of medicinal knowledge in there. Uh, so we want to get the names of the plants for, for this purpose. And this Japanese scholar, she, you know, I don't blame him, he didn't know what to do, so he just gave the Japanese pronunciation of all the names. 
the question of a home run, you know? <laughs> but what else do you do? It's taking forever trying to figure it out. So, you know, we just we just move in bit by bit. So all we can do. Okay, thank you very much. I hope it was a little bit useful.